I was trying to recall today when I met Parta the first time. I think it was uh, probably about eight years ago, and it was not in the most exciting place. It was at, at an SF panel. And <laughs> I, I uh, probably, <laughs> you can imagine that Parta was uh, by far the most outspoken member of this panel. So since then, I definitely remembered him always, OK? <laughs> And uh, I've never had a chance to work with him also. We discussed a couple of times some potential projects, but it never materialized. I uh, remember that one of the things that he liked to talk about was, uh, I, I can uh, try to state this, but it will sound trivial when I say what he was talking about, but it never, uh, I, I never felt that it's trivial when he was saying this, because, uh, you know, he had uh, some way to see certain depths be behind general claims, okay, that many people make these claims, but uh, they mean apparently nothing to them, but it meant something to him. So he, he was, he liked to say that it's impossible to learn anything uh, based on high dimensional data unless, uh, uh, unless, uh, actually, this high-dimensional data has very simple underlying geometric structure, okay? And this structure can be many different things. It can be, for instance, structure of a manifold, or it can be uh, some sparsity involved in, in the problem, and, you know, something like this, okay? Uh, so I, I, I will talk today about uh, one way of, of finding uh, simple underlying structure, and this applies... Uh, uh, to the cases when uh, what you want to learn, or the object you want to learn, is a large matrix, okay? So, uh, 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 a kind of very, very typical problem can be viewed as uh, uh, matrix regression. So, you have a regression model, and the goal is to estimate very large matrix. I denoted this matrix rho here, and uh, it should be based on a finite number of measurements of linear functionals defined on this matrix, and uh, there is some noise involved in this problem also. People looked also at the versions of the problem with no noise at all, and this is also of some interest. And uh, most often people like to look at the case of random design, so this uh, kind of design matrices that define linear functionals are picked at random from, from uh, in my case it will be uh, uh, I will look only at the case of, of uh, Hermitian matrices because it's very easy to see that uh, the case of arbitrary rectangular matrices can be can be reduced to the Hermitian case. Okay, so it will be some a bunch of uh, randomly picked Hermitian matrices, and uh, they define these functionals here. And based on such data, we want to recover matrix rho. And a kind of uh, a simplifying structural assumption will be that uh, the target matrix rho is either low rank matrix or it can be well approximated by uh, by low rank matrices, say. Okay. Uh, later on, I, I, I actually will try to to make a case that this assumption might be. Uh, might be not enough in many cases. It might be still too complex object, okay, a, a low rank matrix, and uh, you might want to combine it with other structural assumptions. But uh, at the moment, let me stick to this assumption. Now, uh, maybe the most common example that people like to look at is a uh, matrix completion problem. In this case, linear functionals that we observe are just entries of the matrix, right? So we just uh, we'll try to recover a uh, small rank matrix based on uh, measurements of uh, finitely many, uh, of a finite number of randomly picked entries, okay, of this matrix. And uh, if there is no noise, uh, then it's kind of natural to assume that you can do it when the number of measurements is of the order M times, uh, I, I'm looking at M times M matrices, M times the rank, okay. M times R, because this is roughly the number of parameters that characterize matrices of ranks R. Okay. Now, uh, there are other examples uh, in addition to matrix completion that uh, are at least as interesting or maybe more interesting. And one example is, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a, a one of the ways to phrase uh, quantum state tomography, which is a very basic problem in quantum statistics. So our goal in this case is to estimate uh, to estimate a density matrix of a quantum system. So it's uh, a, a Hermitian negatively definite matrix of trace one. 
unit trace, plays a role of uh, probability distribution or probability density in quantum mechanics. So if you have uh, a Hermitian matrix S that is uh, an observable, then, uh, you know, if you look at spectral representation of this matrix X, then the eigenvalues of X uh, will be, uh, will be uh, possible values of X when you perform a measurement of X for a system prepared in state Rosse, right? Well, the, the, the values that the observation will take, uh, you know, it will be a random variable with values lambda j. And probabilities to take this value will be these traces of rho time, times pj, where pj is the corresponding spectral projector. Okay, and uh, then uh, the conditional expectation of y given x will be precisely the trace of rho times x. And, uh, and uh, basically the idea then would be to, uh, to pick uh, uh, just a second, to pick uh, possibly at random a bunch of uh, observables, a bunch of Hermitian matrices, and for each of them uh, to perform a measurement, right? You would have to uh, typically to, uh, to, to do it uh, many times. You would have to prepare a system identically in state row many times because these this, um, uh, uh, observables do not necessarily commute. And then uh, by uh, uncertainty principle, you cannot measure them simultaneously. So you, there are some uh, lots of technical difficulties involved in this. But at the end, you are ending up with some data that is described by this uh, trace regression model that I uh, sh showed you at the very beginning. And then you typically do not expect rho maybe to be low rank, but you can expect it to be approximately low rank in the sense that it can be well approximated by low rank matrices. And then this, is, uh, this becomes a version of this problem. Now, in uh, problems like this, both in, in um, in um, matrix completion and uh, in the more general problems in quantum state tomography, uh, kind of, it, it's, it's very common to look at a model of sampling from an orthonormal basis. So we kind of uh, uh, pick uh, uh, this uh, design matrices X1, Xn at random from uh, an orthonormal basis. Uh, it will be, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the cardinality of this basis will be m squared. This is the dimension of the space of all uh, Hermitian matrices, Hermitian m times m matrices. And uh, then uh, typically you put uniform distribution on this basis and start sampling from this uniform distribution. Okay. Then uh, there is uh, a natural way to measure size of the matrix that is related to the sampling procedure. Okay, and this would be to look at L2P uh, norm of, of the linear functional generated by the matrix. If A, for instance, is is a sort of the error of your estimator, the error of your estimator, then this will be sort of uh, risk, you know, kind of natural prediction risk in this problem because what what you are measuring is linear functional, and what you are trying to predict is also linear functional, right? And this is uh, not going to be uh, Hilbert-Schmidt norm, square of Hilbert-Schmidt norm. It will be rescaled. Hilbert-Schmidt norm, uh, if you compute this expectation, it will be precisely m to the power minus 2. So it will be a scaling factor like this times the square of the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. So it's, it's a rather weak norm in a sense, okay, comparing with the Hilbert-Schmidt norm because of the scaling factor. Also up to the scaling factor is the same. Okay. Now, uh, uh, a couple of very, very typical examples, uh, again, is uh, what I said is matrix completion. In this case, in this case, uh, this is a kind of Hermitian matrix of matrix completion. In this case, you can, you can pick an orthonormal basis this way. And uh, basically, what it gives you, it gives you, you know, these uh, guys in the basis would give you diagonal entries when you start looking at Fourier coefficients in this basis, you will, you will get, you will recover diagonal entries, right, that are real numbers. And these guys will give you real parts of the off-diagonal entries, and these guys will give you imaginary parts of off-diagonal entries. So basically, you are uh, lo looking at a sample of Fourier coefficient in this basis would mean, uh, you know, kind of sampling real and imaginary parts of the entries, right? This will be kind of a mix of real and imaginary part of the entries in your sample, and then based on such data, you want to recover the matrix. This is one, one 
uh, example, you know, of sampling from an orthonormal normal basis. Another example that, uh, that really occurs in quantum state tomography problem is to look at what is called Pauli basis. This is something, something that physicists like. Uh, you, you basically create Pauli basics, ba basis in, in the, you know, for matrices of size uh, 2 to the power k times 2 to the power k. This will be sort of the, 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 the space of observables for a quantum system that consists of k qubits, okay? Uh, you create this basis by tensorizing Pauli basis uh, in the space of two times two matrices. These are kind of standard Pauli matrices, and you, you, you use them to form a basis, okay? It's something that, that is uh, convenient for physicists to use. Okay, uh, so, so then you can uh, try to implement quantum state tomography just by, by, by sampling uh, matrices at random from the Pauli basis and trying to measure Fourier coefficients, right, of the, of the density matrix. This is the idea here. Okay, so now uh, I will uh, look at a couple of, uh, uh, at a couple of results uh, that were obtained in this type of problems. Uh, so I will start with the case when there is no noise involved. You are just measuring precisely a bunch of, uh, a bunch of linear functionals, right? Of the matrices, you know, 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 know them precisely. And then uh, kind of as a standard uh, method that people like is to minimize nuclear norm over, over the affine subspace of all matrices that, uh, that basically fit the data precisely, right? That fit the data precisely. And uh, I'm not mentioning uh, all the work that has been done on this. You know, there has been lots of work before these papers were written. I'm just trying to tell you about certain line of, uh, line of theoretical work in, in an attempt to understand how this, uh, this procedure performs, okay? Uh, so, uh, 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 there is one very simple observation that one can make immediately if one starts thinking, for instance, about matrix completion problems, that if you, uh, in the case of simple matrix completion, in the case of simple matrix completion, actually there are, there are matrices that would be extremely hard to recover, right? Uh, these are matrices that are very sparse. For instance, if you take a matrix that has has non -zero, uh, just one non-zero entry, the rest of the entries are zeros, right? And then you start to, uh, to trying to recover this matrix based on a sample, random sample of entries, right? Random sample of entries. And unless uh, this sample is of the order m squared, you can do nothing, right? You can do nothing because just with overwhelming probability, you, you won't see the non-zero entry, right? You won't see the non-zero entry. So you have to find a way to eliminate such obstructions to low rank recovery. And a kind of a standard way to do it is to introduce uh, something that is called low coherence condition. So you, uh, you know, there is a way to define certain quantities denoted here new that characterize this low coherence property. And basically, the idea is kind of to, 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 to make the entries to spread evenly, right, across the matrix, not, uh, not to allow the matrix to be too sparse, right? And if uh, you have this low coherence assumption, low coherence assumption, there is the following result, which, you know, in this version is due to gross also, Initial version is due to condescent tau with, with uh, a worse logarithmic factor. And uh, the improvement by gross is not only the improvement of logarithmic factor, it's the improvement of the technology of the proof. Uh, he made it much simpler than in the, uh, still non-trivial, but much simple, simpler than the initial, in the initial paper of condescent tau. But basically the result tells us that with, with, with very high probability you can recover by using this method based on nuclear norm minimization, the target matrix precisely. Uh, uh, provided that the number of uh, measurements uh, exceeds uh, this threshold. And the main part of it, if you forget about logarithmic factor, is uh, this coherence constant. And then you have uh, rank times m. And this is what we, uh, what we want, actually, right? We want to have something of the order of rank times m, right, in this, in this type of problems. Okay. 
Now, if I start looking at uh, at uh, noisy version of the problem, then kind of uh, the most straightforward uh, way to define an algorithm in this case would be uh, kind of to to to, to do uh, a, a penalized version of least squares, right? You are trying to feed the matrix in this case to the data using least squares, but you are adding nuclear norm as a complexity penalty, right? You are adding nuclear norm as a complexity penalty. And uh, with some choice of regularization parameter. And this method has been extensively studied in the recent years, okay, but uh, recent, I don't know, couple of years, okay, very, very recently. But uh, in addition to this, there are some other ways to pose the problem, okay, to pose the problem. This is one way, okay. This is actually a way to get around some technical difficulties that occur in the analysis of the uh, of, the, of the previous method, okay, that I showed you with uh, with, with, with uh, exact version of least squares, say, okay. What uh, is done here, you know, if you look at uh, at uh, at the empirical rate that corresponds to least square method, right? There is this thing involved in this empirical risk. This is L2 norm, but with respect to the empirical distribution. Right, L2 norm with respect to the empirical distribution. Now, in the case of uh, such problems as uh, as sampling from 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 uh, from orthonormal basis, when we know the design distribution precisely, you can replace this empirical distribution by the true distribution here. So you can make this this term uh, uh, not not random and not data dependent, and this is uh, this allows to to analyze problem in a simpler way actually to to get around some technical difficulties that occur in the analysis of, uh, uh, of the problem with this risk. This is what we did when, in our paper with Karim Lunice and Sasha Tsibakov. And I will show you some results for this method. There are some other versions of the method. This is, for instance, what, uh, what I was trying to do in the case of, uh, of uh, the problem of estimation of, uh, 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 of density matrix in quantum state tomography. In this case, I am using uh, von Neumann entropy actually negative von Neumann entropy as a penalizer on this problem. And also it's possible to show that it kind of uh, allows you to achieve low rank recovery, okay? But uh, w w what I want uh, to do now, since I want to spend uh, some time on, on, uh, on a slightly different problems, okay? On slightly different problems, what I want to do, I will show you uh, uh, I will show you uh, a result uh, 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 of certain analysis of this type of problems only uh, only in the case of this uh, estimator. Okay, so it's a, a sort of linearized version of least squares, linearized in the sense that that quadratic term uh, term here becomes non-random. Okay, non-random. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, there is one characteristic, additional characteristic that will be used in order to, uh, to, to, to state the result, and this is the, the, uh, the uh, L-infinity norm of the matrix. By this, I mean just, just uh, the maximal Fourier coefficient, right, in, in the orthonormal basis, right? I'm looking at the model of something from an orthonormal basis here. Uh, now, if you... Look at this problem, and uh, this is what uh, uh, what we were able to prove in this case. Uh, th this is the bound on this error that is def that is L two with respect to the design distribution. So it's a rescaled uh, Hilbert Schmidt norm in this case, rescaled Hilbert Schmidt norm, and uh, this error is controlled by uh, by you know if you forget about this extra term which is maximal Fourier coefficient of the matrix, right? Square of the maximal Fourier coefficients. This is what one uh, wants here, okay? This is what one wants here, because what we have here, we have the variance of the noise times the rank of the target matrix and times uh, the size of the matrix, right? Ranks times, si times the size is the number of the parameters we need in order to characterize matrices of ranks row, uh, of certain rank, right? 
in order to characterize matrix uh, of Frank R, say we need R times M parameters. Then uh, we sort of divide variance by the number of observations, right? By the number of observations and multiplies this by the number of degrees of freedom that we have in this problem, right? This is what 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 one would expect, right? And in fact, one can uh, one can uh, show uh, minimax lower bounds based on some you know uh, relatively standard information theoretic analysis of the problem that would show that uh, this is optimal. Right? This is optimal. So up to this uh, uh, additional term, right? Additional term, uh, this is an optimal bound. You can do better with, uh, with whatever method you use, right? With whatever method you use. And this is very natural, okay? That, that one can do better than this. However, it should be a, a little disappointing, okay? It should be a little disappointing because uh, even if you don't care about this term much, right? If, if you assume that the variance is equal to one, then it tells you that what you need, right? What you need uh, would be uh, basically the product of rank times m and divided by n, right? There are some logarithmic factors. Let's forget even about logarithmic factors. So n still should be uh, much larger, much larger than than m times uh, the rank. Right in this type of problems, it, it, it's unavoidable. And what you are getting as a result, what you are getting as a result, you are getting bound not even on Hilbert Schmidt norm. You are getting bound on this norm, which is just the 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 average of the squares of the uh, of the of the errors for for the entries of the matrix, right? So just the average over the whole matrix. So the, uh, if you want to replace it by Hilbert Schmidt norm, you would have to divide it by m square. Right by m square, so we are getting a bound on a very weak norm, right? And this bound is as good as it can be, right? Based on minimax analysis, right? And uh, that's all uh, one can do in this case, right? So the only hope can be that maybe the variance is very small, right? In this problem, right? Then, then, then you can uh, hope that you will recover anything. Otherwise, uh, you know, you 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 are not really recovering anything, right? You're doing this in the best possible way, but the best possible way is still very bad. Okay, so uh, this uh, probably tells us that uh, that uh, in, in many cases in this type of problems, uh, you know, uh, unless we have more structure than this low rank structure, okay, uh, the problem is uh, in many respects will be hopeless, right? You, 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 in many situations, you will need to rely on more structure than 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 just low rank. Assumption that is made typically on the analysis of this problem. Okay, now we will skip some uh, slides that tell you, uh, you know, a little more about various versions of this bounds and jump to uh, this topic. It's an attempt to bring a little bit more structure. Okay, uh, to, to the problem in order to try to to gain a little bit comparing with uh, with what is done only uh, uh, under under the assumption that the matrix is low rank. Uh, the problem is the following: Imagine that uh, the, that we have a connected graph, and uh, delta is uh, the Laplacian of this graph. I denote it by a the adjacency matrix. D is, uh, you know, the, the, the matrix with uh, with degrees of the of the vertices on the diagonal, you know, kind of uh, standard definition. Now, uh, 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 what I am looking at, I am looking at uh, this triple, right, in which v and v prime are just randomly picked uh, uh, randomly picked vertices of the graph. So we have two randomly picked vertices, and then there is a label attached to these vertices that tells us, for instance, whether these two vertices are in love uh, or whether they hate each other, okay? So uh, if y is equal to plus one, then it means that these two vertices are in love, otherwise they, they just hate each other, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, I'm assuming that uh, these are independent vertices sampled from the uniform distribution for simplicity. I will call this label y similarity of v and v prime, but uh, you know, you can, you can uh, Kind of uh, uh, invent your favorite story and uh, name it the way you want. Okay, it does not matter. Uh, now, uh, 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 basically, the, the conditional distribution of y in this case is completely characterized, uh, since this is a binary label, it's completely characterized by the regression function. 
by the regression function for this problem, I call in this case this regression function a similarity kernel. Okay, it will be a similarity kernel in this problem. And if you take sine of this uh, similarity kernel, this will be uh, the Bayes classifier in this problem, the optimal way to predict y based on, uh, on two vertices, right? Based on two vertices. Now, uh, assume that uh, we have uh, n IID copies of uh, VV prime y, right? And this is our training data, right? So someone, uh, uh, you know, we, we picked at random n uh, couples of vertices, right, in the graph, and someone told, uh, told us about each couple, whether they, they are in love or whether they hate each other. So we collected this data. Right, we collected this data, and then the goal would be to estimate a similarity kernel for this problem. That would allow us, in principle, to, to start classifying, you know, couples of vertices for which we don't have any information, right? So uh, if we uh, do not assume anything in this case about the graph, if we don't have any, any information about the graph structure, this is just, uh, and we assume only that the, this, uh, this kernel S star is low rank, so it means that, uh, that you know, if you write spectral decomposition, you will have some eigenfunctions for this kernel, and there will be only few, few eigenfunctions that are needed in order to say whether, whether, whether vertices love each other or not, right, uh, reliably, okay? So it basically means that this, this depends on, 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 uh, on, on a small number of features, say. Right? This depends on a small number of features. If you assume only this, this will be just a version of low rank recovery problem, nothing else, right? But, uh, but we assume that there is some structure of this graph, right? It gives us some geometry. And in this case, of course, we can hope that maybe we can do better if we, for instance, assume that, uh, that, uh, that the, the target kernel is uh, smooth on the graph, right? Has some smoothness, right? How to take into account this smoothness? For instance, you can uh, use uh, either of this method, either least squares or uh, this modified version of least squares that I told you about. And on the top of a nuclear norm penalty that is used to kind of to promote low rank uh, structure of the matrix, right? On the top of nuclear norm, add another penalty that would penalize for non-smoothness, right? And this should be Sobolev type norm. Okay, Sobolev type norm in this case, so we have Laplacian on the graph, so we can use Sobolev type norm. So this matrix W that we are using here can be uh, up to some constant. It's convenient to use some constant here. It uh, will be, for instance, piece power of, uh, of the Laplacian, right? Piece power of the Laplacian. If you uh, look at what is happening, for instance, in the case when P is equal to 1, then this thing that I am using as a penalty in this case can be written, I'm always getting confused with this factor one half, whether it's needed or not. It depends on how you write uh, these things on the graph, but uh, forget about this. But basically, uh, this is a weighted sum. The weights are, uh, are, are eigenvalues of the, of the target kernel, right? Squares of the eigenvalues of the target kernel of this thing that, uh, that basically characterize, characterize the smoothness of eigenfunctions of the target kernel, right? So we, in addition to, to this low rank property, we want a little bit more we want eigenfunctions of the kernel to, to have some smoothness on the graph, and we are uh, trying to enforce this by, by penalizing right, properly our problem. So what one can say about this problem? I, I will make some assumption on this uh, matrix W that, as I told you, up to, up to a factor just is a power of the Laplacian of the graph. Uh, I will assume that uh, the main assumption is that uh, I will assume that the eigenvalues uh, grows, grow with certain rate, okay? So have some rate of growth characterized by, by this parameter beta, okay? By this parameter beta. And then uh, uh, another assumption will be a weak version of low coherence assumption for the target matrix S star, but this will be a kind of low coherence with respect to the, to the, uh, to the eigenfunctions, to the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Okay, with respect to eigenfunctions of the, to the, of the, of the Laplacian. Usual, usual low coherence assumption and low rank recovery is with respect to the canonical basis. 
right? In this case, this is the orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but I call it weak low coherence assumption because I, I uh, uh, in, in, in the usual, you know, low coherence assumption, say, of, con of Candace and Rech, for instance, uh, you, you would have a bound of this type on, on these guys. Here I am imposing this bound on certain averages. Okay, of this guy, so yeah, I'm, I'm almost done, so don't worry. Yeah, we'll have dinner, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so here, here is what, uh, what uh, we were able to prove. This is, I maybe mentioned somewhere, this is a joint work with my student, Pedro Rangel, in this problem. This is rather, rather a preliminary result, I should say. If you, if you uh, look at uh, this thing, which is actually a square of certain Sobolev type norm, right, of the target, Right, so we have type norm of the of the target. If you choose properly uh, the regularization parameters in this problem, then uh, this is the bound we were able to prove. This is the bound we were able to prove. So it, it should be compared with what you would you would get without using the second penalty, right? If you if you choose epsilon one equal to zero, right? When there is no second penalty, and when this is just purely a low rank recovery problem. So. Uh, what will happen in this case, uh, you know, I'm kind of trying to write this bound in, in simplifying way, dropping some of the parameters, right, that, that are in the actual bound. This is what we have in the, in the standard, uh, standard uh, low rank recovery case with nuclear norm penalty. What, what you will get will be MR log M divided by M. Now, what we are getting in this problem is, uh, is this thing, right? So we are gaining something and we are losing something, right? What we are gaining, uh, what we are losing, we are, we are getting a worse, a worse dependence on the sample size, right? Because there is this uh, thing twice beta or, or twice beta plus one, which is that is smaller than one, right? That is smaller than one. Uh, what we are gaining, we, we don't have factor M any longer. In the, in, in the numerator, right? We don't have this. And then it is easy to see that the second bound will be uh, much better, actually, than the first bound, provided that, that M is uh, sufficiently large. And sufficiently large means just uh, bigger than, say, N to the power 1 over twice beta plus 1, right? So if, for instance, you take beta equal to one half, this is sort of the smallest that I allow to take in this bound, then you will get, uh, you will get uh, what? You will get here n to the power one half. So n should be should be smaller than m squared, right? In this case, already this bound that takes into account smoothness is better, right? Is better. Uh, if you take, uh, if you let beta to go to infinity, right? So you assume just that it's uh, it's uh, infinitely differentiable, right? In a way, right? If you let beta go to infinity, you will get uh, you will get the same bound as this, but without factor m. So you are gaining factor m in this case, right? Which which, which is uh, which can mean a lot in this problem if you assume that m is. If you have, uh, I don't know, a network with, with thousand nodes, for instance, it will be factor thousand, right, in this case. So uh, you can definitely gain something. I, I, I told you that this is uh, rather preliminary thing. Uh, it's preliminary because at the end, I think uh, there should be a more flexible way to write this bound so that, uh, so that you, will, you will get uh, correct dependence on n and so that you would be able to recover kind of standard low rank recovery theory, right, from this type of bounds as well, okay? But uh, we have not been able to do it so far, so it's just a certain step in, in this direction, but I have to stop here. Well, thank you.